Hi, everyone, and welcome to my podcast, Perfect Prey. I'm glad you're here. My name is Dr. Christine Marie Cocciola, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and have a doctorate in clinical social welfare, where I research course of control and the impact on both adult and child victims. Most importantly, I am a survivor and a protective parent. Victims and survivors of course of control are never to blame. But I chose the name Perfect Prey because course of controllers who are individuals who apparently have characterologically disordered personalities do choose who to prey upon. They choose people who tend to be agreeable and conscientious, perhaps loyal to a fault, fixers, optimistic, and empathic. Or these course of controllers prey upon those who are most vulnerable including our children. It's part of their plan to gain control. How do we help our children when they're experiencing systematic, unacknowledged child abuse? We need to understand how these course controllers, harmful individuals attempt to exert their power over us and our children. We need to look beyond a trauma-informed lens, but also layer it with a course control lens. So, Let's engage in personal power conversations that will create the protective parts that will derail the course of controller from his plan. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Perfect Prey. I'm so glad you're here. I am really excited. We're on episode nine, and I know I'm not getting these out as fast as people would like, but please remember to subscribe and to share. I do believe a lot of people will find validation in this podcast. Ideally, what I'm looking forward to doing going forward is having young people on who have clarity, who have recognized what's happened in their family system and see clearly that there was one parent who was a course of controller and who harmed them. So if you know anyone, if you know a young person who would like to be on the podcast and to be interviewed by me, please send me their information or have them reach out to me at admin at drcochiola.com. As you might recall, in episode eight, we really began diving into this idea of fight versus fawn, mostly, in relationship to how children respond in these situations. And of course, every single conversation that we are having is really a conversation about what the adult victim survivor experienced. But again, pivoting, putting on our course of control glasses, goggles, and looking at those experiences as similar to the experiences of children. Again, as I always say, this started day one. Don't for one minute think that this abuser was not intentionally trying to fracture, maliciously fracture that attachment with you simply to gear up in case there was an intent on escaping the relationship. So we talked last time in episode eight about fight, you know, that these children oftentimes will take on the role of, and again, it's just role modeling. They are not abusers. We don't call them abusers, no matter how horrifyingly they behaved, because that's not them. That's what they've been conditioned to do over and over again just as if they were in a war, right? And so they get into fight mode very often, particularly when they're with you. And I like to really like be clear about this. It's because, yes, deep down inside, they know you're safe. But the other part of that is that maybe they don't know you're safe because they've been so betrayed by you and they're fighting back. So it's really twofold. It's not always 100% that they know you're the safe parent. So knowing that they have fawned, as I talked about in episode eight, they have fawned the entire time there with the abuser. This is what they do all day long, that there is such significant fawning going on because it's a way to retain safety with that abusive parent. And so what I want to talk a little more about today is the other two types of trauma responses. And I hope that as I'm talking about them, you're getting an understanding of, again, your own experiences. How many times do we hear of a victim survivor fighting back, whether it's physically or otherwise, perhaps starts name calling, perhaps putting down the abuser. And again, the abuser in that situation has trapped over and over again. And finally, the victim decides to fight back. 
That is not mutual abuse. That is not reactive abuse. That is called self-defense. When you're in the den with a wolf, eventually you're going to fight back. But what we know is that fight response is really a hypervigilance, an irritability. It's, a, it's again, a long-term maladaptive coping skill. And it results in potential threats. So for the children, when they're coming home, they might be getting into fight mode because they, there's a potential threat if they don't by the abuser. But the other part of that is that when we as protective parents have not really been able to regulate ourselves and are sometimes defensive or reactive to our children's behaviors, their initial response is going to defend is going to be to defend themselves. They are going to fight back. So how do we remedy this? We remedy it by creating a calm space, by co-regulating with them, which is by the way, this is again why I always say all protective parents going through these situations need to be in their own trauma-informed care. They need to have a clinician supporting them because if they don't, then they're not going to be able to regulate themselves. And frankly, that's not your fault. That's the trauma. That's what's happened to you over and over and over again. That's why we always say Again, course of control, the foundation of virtually all abuses, as I've talked about before. But that's why we always say that this abuse, when it's more covert, is just so overwhelming and creates tons of flooding. Like there's just an inability to regulate because it's, again, this mind bending of your reality, a really significant mind bending of your reality. So now think about that child who is supposed to be angry with you, really upset with you, or has been told you don't love them. Yeah, they're going to be defensive. And especially if you're not regulated. How important is your regulation? It's really very primary, which is, again, I'm not suggesting this is easy. We also talked about fawn in episode eight, and really knowing that's who you were a lot of the time in that relationship. You would placate, you would walk on eggshells, you would do whatever you could to please, to just create a space where there was some stability, any stability. And again, this is what our children are doing virtually all of the time with the abuser. And they may, in fact, think they have to do this with us. That's the, like, the startling part, is that they may be doing this with us and we don't even know it. So ask yourself, Does your child have agency? Ask yourself, is your child being given opportunities at your home to make choices, to compromise? Are they seeing you compromise? Are they in some ways understanding, again, how important is this, the difference between you and the abuser? Because it's really interesting because these abusers can be very authoritarian in their parenting, which means they don't want, allow a lot of choice and the children know they need to follow the abuser. However, they can also be what we call laissez-faire, which means they just allow the children to do whatever they want. So ask yourself, do you have a little fawner in your home? Do you have a child who just naturally is fawning with you, even though there's no threat? If they are, we need to teach them very clearly how to have appropriate boundaries, what they can say no to, how to engage in self-care, how they don't have to be parentified with us. They cannot be parentified with us because that's what they're doing all of the time with the abuser. Think about it. Are they taking care of the abuser? Is the abuser playing victim? Is the abuser pretending that they are so distraught over this divorce or separation or you having maybe a new partner? If that's all the case, then those are the things that could be happening very regularly with your child over there. And when they come home, are they doing the same thing with you? Be sure that you're creating clear boundaries, that they're not able to do that with you. So there are basically four types of trauma responses, although there's talk of a fifth and there used to be only three. I think we're just really learning so much more about trauma and understanding how it manifests. So fight, one, flight, freeze, and fawn. We've already 
basically reviewed fight and fawn and how our children respond in this way sometimes with us, with the abuser. And that's what I really want you to be looking for is how is your child responding to you in these modalities, right? What is their maladaptive coping to their own trauma? Flight is this idea of like in a fleeing, of course, fleeing from the threat and really like some maladaptive coping that oftentimes may result in avoiding relationships and and creating social isolation, really having this idea of escaping from things. And this escape can be a variety of ways. So if you have a little one or a not so little one who is a high achieving student and you're not worried about them. I remember speaking to a mom once and she's like, oh, he's fine. He's like so invested in school. He gets A's all the time. Great student. And also athletically like pushes himself and just is doing great. And my thought is, is that a trauma response? Because it very well can be. Sometimes when, and ask yourself this about yourself, what was the way that you tried really hard to figure out how to navigate this relationship? Did you, of course, you know, begin to escape in other ways? It makes sense, right? And so sometimes these children who are overworking themselves or needing to be an A, they're perfectionists. This is like this idea of everything has to be in order and organized and very much aligned with this overachieving. So it might be over-exercising. It could be, of course, reckless behavior. It could be disordered eating, like really controlling everything that they're eating. And certainly, of course, the use of substances, as all of these can truly, the trajectory can be other types of coping mechanisms that are extremely harmful. So again, ask yourself, is your child really working super hard and is part of that an escape? And if it is, how do you help them? to see that they are overworking, that they don't need to be A students, that they don't have to be the best or the second best on the soccer team. How do you help them with that? Now, it's really tricky if the abuser is requiring them to be the best at these things. If the abuser's basically fundamental way of feeling good is when the children are doing good or when a particular child, again, knowing that there are different roles in the family system and these are constantly changing. So really being aware of what's going on with your child and helping them to realize they don't have to be perfect, that they don't have to overwork, they don't have to avoid, and they don't have to isolate. And so really a challenging thing to observe with our children, especially when we can see it. I can say this uh, from experience. When you see that child who is overexerting themselves and you realize what it is, there is this recognition that the family system obviously contributed to that, right? And how do we help them as they're growing to see that they don't need to do that? The other one, freeze, is really about this, I am going to freeze in the face of threat to avoid being further targeted by the predator. And so if I just stay still, and that means physically, but metaphorically, if I just don't disrupt the apple cart, This is beyond, fawning is pleasing. This is not about, this is just like, let me just tiptoe around. And so really these are people who are disassociating from the present day reality. They are not really thinking about how bad it is. So when your kid comes home and says, everything's fine, what are you worried about? Or I'm not upset, that didn't bother me when they maybe were just verbally assaulted by the abusive parent. Ask yourself, are they in freeze mode? Are they attempting to disassociate from the circumstances? And this isn't just disassociate today and during these circumstances. This is disassociate over the long haul. How do we help them not to disassociate over the long haul? Because obviously our overwhelming goal is that they gain clarity, right? So in that, are they using maybe, are they playing too many video games? This is really hard to assess in this day and age when children are always on technology, right? So are they over, overly involved in television, in the internet, perhaps misusing substances? Are they creating an emotional numbness? And ask yourself again, what's the question here? Is their behavior a result of wanting to create numbness? And you can watch that. Now, this is, again, this idea of being CIA, like creative, intentionally, and attuned to them. Watch these things. Watch for them. 
Look for these little red flags and ask yourself, is this what my child's doing? How do we support them? You know, we start to, we, of course, create boundaries if we can with too much technology or perhaps if they're using substances, how do we create some boundaries there? But also having conversations about what trauma is. Our children need to know. This is all psychoeducation. They need to know. And ask, ask us, mom, let's talk about what your trauma response is. And let's have these conversations, these very open dialogues about what each of our trauma responses are, by the way, in the here and now, because they can change over time. Oftentimes, I see this over and over again with people, I, I heard this recently on Dr. Romney was talking about it, and this is what my research study was about, is that oftentimes you can be in fawn mode very for a very long time and relatively subjugated. And in that subjugation, eventually when you are just done, you're, you've lost, you're, you're tired of being trapped in the den with the wolf, you might fight back, right? We see this over and over again. This is not, again, abuse. It is self-defense. So seeing that your children are defending themselves in that moment, seeing with flight that they are avoiding whatever is going on. They're trying hard to remain, I guess, if nothing else, they're fleeing from the situation, but they're trying to remain smaller, very much like Freeze does, right? But in that, are they having a lot of challenges in handling conflict? Do they avoid dealing with issues that are upsetting to them versus the Freeze, where they basically are just doing anything to avoid being further targeted? And they disassociate from the circumstances that are going on in their life. And they do that by perhaps getting way engaged in something they shouldn't be. And in back to flight, by the way, of course, again, these A students, these high achieving children, they are not doing well all the time. They may be, but they may not be doing well. This is their trauma response. And then finally, what you're already aware of is fawn. So I hope that's been helpful for everyone. Just a little unpacking of that. We are going into episode 10. I will be talking on in episode 10. I will just simply be reading my testimony that I did uh, regarding the experiences of children. So looking forward to seeing you soon. And please remember to subscribe and take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to Perfect Prey. You can find the show on my website at iknowyourheart.com or courseofcontrolconsulting.com or subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts. I'd love your feedback, and I'm always looking for ideas on how to continue to expose course control as the significant harm and child abuse that it is. The best way to support the show is to rate and review Perfect Prey on Apple Podcasts. It helps others to find us. Perfect Prey is written by me, Dr. Christine Cocciola, and with the help of my amazing assistant, Sheena Pastor. Thank you, and have a great day, everyone.